So I actually had a little difficulty thinking about who was this group and um, what did you already know? Uh, what could I uh, offer you, especially if what I was supposed to do was talk for about 15 minutes and have you interrupt that, if you wish, <laughs> or um, at least outline that I have sort of three chunks in this talk. I thought, what do I have to offer to a group that is pretty well already schooled in learning theory. And also, I think you probably already had, uh, with a force concepts inventory orientation, pretty good introduction to assessment. So I'm starting there thinking you know that and we can push that some more. Um, but I'd also like in the conversation to link it to um, learning processes in the classroom. So the three chunks are a pretty old and familiar talk um, since I think I was invited because of the science uh, editorial about next generation assessments. I no, no, you were invited because of who you are. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm now I'm much taller than I was before. Um, so um, talking about next generation assessments is one conversation, and that has this old label of authentic assessment. Uh, but what you're probably even being invited to write grants about, I, I thought I couldn't come and talk about assessments without a little bit about learning progressions because it's uh, just the thing that NSF is paying attention to when uh, invited to an assessment conversation. So let's talk a little bit about learning progressions. Remembering that you know more about the content than I do. So I'll sort of have to wave my hands and ask you to think about what that would look like in the particular field where you're talking. And then I would like to get to the last chunk there, which is about learning theory and the processes of learning that I think we've given a lot of attention to in trying to change norms in K-12 classrooms. But I think it's harder to do in um, higher ed. Um, Mary's the expert here in doing this uh, with things like formative assessment. Several of you are experts. Mary, in particular, in trying to change norms around assessment processes as they relate um, to uh, students' learning. I think we could have a whole event, you could invite me another time, to talk about how our grading practices, for example, uh, shape students' understanding of what is to be learned, and also even how they should try to learn. Uh, so we'll, t we'll, we'll hint at some of that. This is a little bit more focused just on the interactions. In K-12 classrooms, we have the luxury that we're with kids longer. Um, that is, we can help them practice what we're later going to ask them to demonstrate. And we can give much more uh, more frequent iterations of getting good at something so that then I can finally hold you accountable to that on a final examination demonstration of your having arrived. Um, I think time is the enemy in higher ed. And so the last part of the talk is sort of inviting you to think about how much of that could you still do uh, in this setting. So. Um, this is uh, something you already know, uh, that assessments are important not just as measurements. And nearly everybody who sits down and can try them thinks, how can I measure what the students know? And uh, forget this other very important symbolic uh, function, which is um, how students infer from the assessment what it means to be good in a subject. Um, long ago, and you'll notice quite a number of my dates are, are very old, and I'm giving you like the, the, here's the beginning of this way of thinking. So these were colleagues of mine, Hilda Borko and Margaret Eisenhart, long ago found out that fluent readers, if you ask them what are you trying to do when you read, they're trying to understand the story. And kids who struggle are interrupted to get fluent in reading circle and think that a good reader is someone who can read without making mistakes. And they don't know, necessarily, because uh, that's a separate thing that we learn, is that the point of reading the story uh, is to understand what's going on in the story, be able to retell something about the story, so you can actually change those perceptions by having kids retell you the story. 
they aren't very good at the first time, the next time, they're better at it because your expectation helps them understand what's important to do. And um, you obviously know and uh, live and uh, live to resist this understanding uh, that physics students have uh, about what it is, a set of facts to be memorized. Um, this is the classic example from Eric Mazzulli's work that shows that how uh, problem by problem you convince students to uh, get good at something by doing the procedural problem at the bottom and then you discover that when you ask them a conceptual question like the one, I think this is in his peer instruction book, uh, when you look at the conceptual question at the top, um, they aren't able to do it. Uh, the private universe film is an example of really conceptual things that you assume that kids can do, especially when they can do the procedural things and they aren't necessarily able to do it. So this says we have to be very purposeful about um, how we construct assessment questions so that we convey to students what's important and then that that's what we're measuring. Um, in parallel to the Mazur work, uh, in fact, I think we were actually, I'm looking at the date, we, we were actually doing this first uh, in K-12 education. Um, high stakes testing came in in, edu in educational settings uh, in the early 80s. And so um, we actually had a lot of experience with teaching the test. So Mazur's work could be characterized as uncovering the consequences of teaching to the test, studying to the test. And what we did in some large scale studies was um, with representative samples of students, we examined what they knew with parallel tests that we made that imitated the content but used quite different formats. And so what you see here, just getting used to the, the pointing, <laughs> you do have a set of flags that you can. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, and then planes land. It yeah, gets yeah, very exactly. Exactly. I just like right this way. Uh, the graph at the bottom is the one problem, and we actually did this for a whole uh, assessment in districts where they had been giving tests that mattered a lot in the rankings of those schools in the newspaper. And obviously, our problem on the right is more difficult than the just flashcard problem on the left. But there should be a relationship. And uh, the left right on the graph shows you how much harder the area problem is for everybody. But the important finding in our study that we aggregated you know, across all the items was the difference between the E line and the B line. This happened to be District B in the study we're doing. We did this in several different states in large school systems where there had been teaching to the test represented by the items on the left. And so in the B district, the fall off is much greater than in the equating district where we equated the difficulty of the two tests. So we could say uh, what in settings the tests were equally unfamiliar. That's what those were equating districts. Um, and even if we had constituted a, diff a difficulty that was greater, you see that one problem is harder than the other, uh, we were able to say how much more difficult was it for students who appeared to know the problem on the left. And we did this item after item after item in building uh, quasi-parallel forms to evaluate that. This is, this is sort of the foundational work in what came to be called the teaching the test literature that showed um, the failure to generalize from the taught two tests to the others. And people have a suspicion that this is a problem. They have a suspicion that it's a problem for what it teaches, my first point, the, what it teaches you about the discipline. But do you even really know it is the question we're trying to address with this research. And that's very important because a lot of policymakers will say better that they just learn the basics. Um, and so what we're actually illustrating is that they're not really learning the basics. 
Um, and that is exemplified then by some other large-scale studies. Um, this is the so the data from Bob Lynn, my colleague, uh, just pulling together uh, state data for two states, Maryland and Texas. And the Texas graph is famous, it's referred to as the Texas miracle. This is actually the uh, Bush years as governor uh, and very, very high stakes attached to the uh, results of the state testing program and dramatic improvements from the time the program was instituted uh, till the end of that test. Then they ended up uh, coming up with a different test. Um, but this is the picture across the same years on the National Assessment of Educational Progress for those same two states. So this is uh, an aggregate way of, sh of showing the lie of those dramatic gains in test scores if you just teach the test. Um, and we, c we continue to do this kind of research now, again, because with No Child Left Behind, um, the, the, the ratcheting up of consequences for bad test scores is even higher now in the 2000s than in the 1990s. And what we see now is the districts, good, she's going to interrupt me, uh, districts um, have instituted what, these interim tests that they now give things that look just like the end of year tests every quarter. Um, and so we're getting actually more and more of this kind of problem. Um, my question is about teaching to the test, that phrase, mm -hmm. which of course I'm familiar with, but um, is, the def is your definition or maybe the standard definition in the literature of teaching to the test the idea that you're asking the exact same kind of question and that's what makes teaching to the test? Because it seems like you could argue that if you're trying to um, get a group of students to understand a particular concept, that the more practice you give them with understanding that concept, that they'll be able to perform on a test, and therefore aren't you always kind of teaching to the test? So what, what, how would you uh, distinguish between those kind of two scenarios where one is, is rich and useful, <laughs> and one is just um, repetition? Well, so I mean, that's sort of like the whole point. That's, we could stop here with the science <laughs> and talk about that question. And that's why one of the strands of the talk is, uh, well, how, how would you make a test um, that was less vulnerable to this because we know a lot of things from cognitive psychology about how making learning goals transparent, sharing those, having some shared ownership of trying to get there, all of these processes, last part of the talk that I, I want to talk about, are uh, supportive of a shared understanding. So you don't want to pretend like there isn't this representation. And the test could be, if it were a good sample of the, sort of the culminating uh, proficiency, this is what an adept learner looks like in this field. You're now a master in this field. If you had a complete representation, then you could have that joint agreement. We're both working on getting to this. It's the shortfall between the representation of the goals um, that are exacerbated by teaching the test. So as a researcher, I, you know, people say, well, you're so bad on standardized tests. Why do you use them as outcomes in your studies? I still use standardized measures as outcomes in studies, um, preferably one that's unfamiliar, because I know how these distortions arise. So you do want a sample from the domain. But what we know is in the politicized environment of getting good at it and only it, the way that it represented the domain changes over time. You get it was not full, it was not a full representation in the first place, and then whatever its weaknesses, they're exacerbated by concentrating on this instead of what you really wanted people to know. So the degree of non-generalization for example, is directly related to how bad the representation of the domain wasn't there. So, so basically are you saying if we could get the test to be authentic, then teaching to the test is really okay? Yeah. Um, yes, yes. I mean, that's what's, and what are they, I'm sorry, I can't say the whizzy with the what you see is what you get. 
so some people did say, let's just make tests worth teaching to. So in the when these data were first, so that's kind of my argument now in, in switching and showing you some good examples. Um, but I I am wary even then because even with slightly better ones, uh, writing tests are the next best example. So multiple choice is the worst. Um, not not only because it turns out ETS can make slightly better multiple choice items than the typical classroom teacher. But what was bad was that when a classroom teacher imitates ETS, that's what the kids practice on. So they practice on the worst version of multiple choice. Because it is the case that you can write multiple choice questions to at a high level of inference and uh, require quite a bit of complex thinking. And then you've got sort of this uh, more easily scorable and challenging problem. So you're not all, always against multiple choice tests, but in the context of how they get used, it's highly, very worrisome. Um, so we want to have better items, and writing tests were the next effort, and they're better, but they're also corruptible. You have people uh, cheating by teaching students the uh, scoring algorithms, <laughs> and then, um, in, you know, in the, in the, for example, I sat in workshops, so I used to do, you know, ethnographic work on this stuff, <laughs> where they would say, well, if you don't know where to paragraph, paragraph anywhere, because uh, the scorers are reading too fast to catch <laughs> whether it's a good paragraph. So that, so that's why I say I am very worried that each is corruptible. And what you're trying to negotiate with students is that you want them to own the whole domain of mastery, of which this is a sample. And you actually want to be challenging them all the time. So now we're into the part of the talk about processes. You want to be challenging them all the time about how does this item represent this. So if I have lots of time to talk about people, as soon as you can do this, this version, I will ask you an extension. What about this? Because I don't want to be stuck with this being everything. And we should develop ways of talking with each other in the classroom that make that the norm. Make it, yes, this, this is a piece of it. What's next? Uh, not, ju not just what's the next topic, but what's a more robust challenge to this understanding. So you always want to be going back to that. What's the whole thing? Okay, so this is the argument for building a test that is worth teaching to, in that, in, if you accept that jargon. Or <clears throat> I think conceptually rich, rich problem types is what we're asking you uh, to think about here. And is this what you're able to do in your classroom? Here are some examples that people have thought about uh, from how people learn. If an uh, image is projected, um, through a lens and shows upside down on the screen, what happens if you cover half the lens? So that's a thinking problem. Um, as instead of what do students most get asked to do, they get asked to reproduce the picture in the textbook, right? Label the picture in the textbook. So that would be um, one off, the first way to think about a challenge question to that um, body of work. A battery, light bulb, and wire. Uh, how can you make a light bulb? So if you've seen a private universe, so the, you guys know these films, right? So was it Sadler who made those? So then the next film is the MIT graduation where most of the students can't take the wire bulb and the light bulb uh, and make a circuit even when the uh, circle is uh, being offered to them by the interviewer. Uh, <laughs> So um, those are examples of conceptual questions, like Mazur's question as well. Uh, this is for very young kids. How does a tree get so big from a tiny seed? Um, and, you, and you find out this is a typical conception for very young kids. They really know all about food, um, and they think they're eating food from the soil. Most adults, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Have you tried this? Yeah. 
I don't think that. I just want everybody to know. <laughs> That's good. We could have a we could have a screening of these movies if anybody's interested. So right, because they're we're probably we're worth watching watch. once yeah. in a while. Yeah. Yeah. They, they they make you cry, you know. But <laughs> um, so here are some, you know. And this is this is an old slide, but it was a previous time when I was searching uh, for to learn a little bit about what's going on at higher ed and in the physics community. So this is another Heller example. Um, I think they I think their work they actually tried to do this kind of thing. Think about conceptual representations um, that are challenging to students. Notice characteristics of such problems. Um, you don't signal which is what the unknown is. You know, um, a lot with teaching the test, a lot of times there'll be a format to a word problem where it's pretty easy uh, in how they're asked repetitively uh, what's the unknown and then the hardest thing about the problem is I have to figure out what operation to apply to these other two numbers. And so you get kids uh, in K-12 literally uh, doing that kind of translation. That's the, that's the um, way they learn to solve that kind of problem. So really, actually giving some information that's extraneous is a good thing to get people out of that habit. Um, it's not meant to be tricky. We want people to um, not approach real problems. That's why real world contexts are a big help with this. We want them not to approach real problems as if there is an immediate algorithm, uh, sort of let's search for the formula as the way to try to uh, solve the problem. So another tactic in K-12 is uh, get kids in the habit of drawing pictures to represent the problem before they try to solve it. And another thing. And um, when we talk about uh, scientific practices, then those kinds of norms from the field are very helpful because you want them to have strategies for approaching the problem, including what do I already know? Or how is this problem like something I already know? Those are those would be examples of the processes that go with these kinds of conceptually rich problems. So then I just brought some examples. This is um, uh, Pat Patrick Thompson's questions, which Mary knows that I love. Um, but um, this is an example of something that you could put up with kids and ask them to talk about this and um, ask them to start drawing pictures or pointing. Um, it starts out easy and gets harder, but it is also a way to start having them do here what a learning goal is, is to, to be explicit about parts and holes in a way that young kids um, aren't adept at early. Uh, for example, young kids can do number line representations of fractions before they can do area representations of fractions. And so it helps to know where they start and then also uh, how to get them good at talking from the number line to the area representation in the one case, and in this case, from literally pointing to, drawing a finger around, uh, what's the part, what's the whole. Um, these are pieces, you don't get to see the whole uh, problem here, so this is just a prompt to remind me. Um, you, I hope you have a chance to meet our Freudenthal colleagues from the Netherlands when they're here. Uh, they, we're sort of, uh, through David Webb, uh, the U.S. branch of Freudenthal, and um, they do lovely problems at the University of Utrecht. Um, they help the government uh, write these kinds of problem types for the exams that are used in schools. And this problem asks the students to, uh, and there's a whole series of problems all around the same theme where we're trying to figure out um, the height of the poles for the lights. 
to uh, cover uh, in light the soccer field. So that'd be an example of the geometry problem that actually makes some sense to the students, like why would you want to know this? It's always a good thing to try to answer. This is a <coughs> developed in the uh, 90s, a uh, fifth grade social studies problem for um, kids in um, geography uh, learning about faults and you actually build uh, the San Andreas uh, by with two pieces of cardboard and pouring sand on it so that the kids can watch when you slide one of the plates what looks like mountains moving um, and help them relate that to the geography in California um, and then they're asked a lot of questions and, to, and asked to make predictions. Um, again, I'm showing you um, conceptually rich problems. Um, but notice, um, oh, I forgot I had one more example um, for the biologist. Uh, this is from the state of Wyoming. And I've only reproduced here one of the pages of these little Carmelitica's imaginary uh, critters. Um, page after page after page, so that they had hundreds of them. And uh, then they, the assignment was to construct a phylogenetic tree. Um, so um, I don't know what else, and I sort of lost track because this was such a nice picture, but I, I don't have the text that goes with it anymore. How many constraints they uh, were put on them, they have to explain how they decided who were the uh, parents of origin and how they uh, figured out the linkages, um, <clears throat> but it had to have been more than just those critters. Um, <coughs> to them, I, think. I think there's some options that are given. Some of You've seen this one? Oh, cool. Yeah. <coughs> there's five things. or six different versions that are published. You know? Uh huh. And it was devised for the um, state testing program. It's Why? amazingly rich. In terms of what that, yeah, and it, you can you can see what this is a correct answer, um, what that person had to have figured out to be able to do it, and you can see lots of pathway starts from all the other, which are also encouraging in terms of how far the kids can get, <coughs> even if they can't get all the way there to it, and so they can defend all the way through. <coughs> we have to ask more questions by choke. <coughs> <coughs> Um, so here's where, I, here's where I thought I was, which is because um, I wanted to make the point as we're going through that these conceptually rich problems are interchangeable as a measure that I can put on a state test or as a good instructional activity. To be a valid test of learning, you don't want to use the same one. <laughs> and I have to say this because people then, they do that. We use all practice it here. Now show me again here. No. If we want to ensure generalization, we have to know that they can do this, and then we think about the extension or something that's faithful to the original learning goal, but that asks it in a new context. Could you, could you do something? I mean, so this is so this is very nicely graphic. So I'm thinking graphics a lot. So one thing would be to do a perturbation of the same basic thing and then see how they respond to that. Right. Not the same thing, but in the context of, so you're not changing so many things simultaneously, you know, you're going from, you're sort of comfortable with this idea of this organism and you're not switching them to a totally different one, but you're asking a right. more narrow set of questions. So, it, so this is a, this is another, like, bracket this as a whole other conversation, <coughs> which is how much parallelism and how much <coughs> change to challenge uh, the robustness of their understanding. Well, it's almost like how big a transfer can you expect them to right. be able to make? <laughs> Exactly. And so, if, so you're, and you use the word transfer, so we're tapping into the part of learning research that shows that things don't transfer. Do, it's real, and so that whole branch of psychology is very like the findings that I showed you, very sort of... Um, awkward ways in the teaching the test literature, right? Is that, oh, I thought he knew it. Now I ask it a slightly different way and he doesn't know it. So 
in answer to Mike's question, um, I would start with parallelism and change some of the variables. That's what the test makers do. They use the same forms and they change the numbers. What we learn from that is that that's too tiny a shift because then they, can, they are supported by and held up by the safety, if you will, of that exact form. Change the form a little bit and you're surprised that they can't generalize. And especially if you lay out a continuum here all the way to expert, what do we know about the difference between novice and expert understanding? Experts get past the surface features and can in figure out what the problem is, and novices can. So we don't want to st just stick with the safety, if you will, and the familiarity of a form. Now, many concepts have very different entry points. This is an important concept, surely, in many different contexts. So the trick is to do it enough till you're sure you've got it in a safe way, and then change it in increasingly different ways. So that would be the way to think about extending the knowledge. And by the way, this is an admonition from K-12, sure it's not true here, <laughs> don't ever have it be that you learn something to be done. Lots of learning in K-12 is to wrap it up, be done, okay, we're finished with that, now what are we gonna do? And that's, this has always been the intention of uh, recurring and uh, circular curricula, is come back to it. Use it, use it, not repeat it, Students hate it when they think they're getting the same thing over and over again. Uh, but use it as instrumental to other learning so that you get in the habit of making those connections curricularly to what you've already learned. But now I have to have a fl flexible and robust understanding, like expert, to say, oh, now I can do it this other way. Um, so. I think if you have that schema in your head of the increasingly but, different from where we started. But I mean, the trickiest thing, and maybe you can't expect people to do this, is the sort of eureka moment when you realize that something that appears to be over here is actually occurring over here in a completely unfamiliar, but now you realize, oh, it's the same thing. Oh, yeah. But it looks completely different on the surface. Yeah, exactly. That's right, because experts see how they're the same. But that's also and a creativity surface. moment. So yes. not all experts are creative, right? I mean, there are people who, it turns out there are people who are very plotting, and they do the same thing over and over again. And then there's a very, so the question is, can you reasonably expect eureka moments out of non-Archimedean people? <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so um, I, re I really think lots of this is learned. So that's, that's one of the fundamental lessons, uh, is give up on your, uh, there are this kind of people, and, and come to understand how much that we think is a trait is practiced repertoires, and ways of speaking. Uh, uh, did you think of that? Uh, oh, this is like, so it's why, they finally had to give up on it because they were so controversial, but it's why um, analogies were very good ways of predicting uh, success academically. But it was very true that that was a learned thing. Uh, but some people got to practice it. Um, so that would just, that's a simple example of the kinds of things that people at one point thought was intelligence that is clear that if you if you draw if you make it normative in your classrooms to look for connections to make extensions 
then people get smart at that. They, they look like they're better reasoners over time than if you never ask them to do that. And um, so those, those are the kinds of things we're trying to build into the curriculum around these kinds of problems. What was controversial about analogies? Uh, they had they had the most test bias. They had the most what? Test bias. Uh, it's true that they you know that they stood up to predicting academic performance, the purpose of the test. But because certain kinds of schooling and certain kind of uh, reasoning um, opportunities to reason were available to some uh, groups of kids and not available to others, we had bigger group differences. Um, in ways that's hard to defend on the face of it why uh, uh, the scientific name of butterfly to this is, you know, it's, then that looks that looks biased on the face of it because you really don't need to know what is it, love the doctor uh, you really don't need to know that to be good in college mm -hmm. so that's why, that's why eventually um, you get people gave up on analogies tests, and you certainly don't see them as prevalently because of the bias. But I would argue that using an analogy as part of a form of assessment or just an exercise would be a really good tool for our students. Because doesn't that allow them to think about what's important about whatever concept you're Oh, yeah. And so once they have access to the vocabulary, it's, it's, uh, not, it's not biased inherently. It was lack of access to vocabulary and why were these polo terms uh, being used in an analogy? That would be the worst example. Um, it's, it's privileging that the vocabulary itself is privileged, not the analogy. Thank you for the yeah. clarification. Yeah. I'm sorry, what is an analogies test? Uh, an analogies test is uh, where you have to complete the, um, the sequence this word is to this word, uh, as this is to blank. I see. Okay. It used to be on the SATs and the GRAs. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, so it's like lepidoptera is to marsupial as... Placozoan is to potato. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Obviously, okay. that's the answer. Right. Yes. Have there been any other structures for like analogy type tests? I mean, besides just this word is like that word. I mean, it, are people asked to give an analogy for things? Is, is that used anywhere? Is that tracked? Any other uh, no. functions of analogies been tracked at all? I haven't. I haven't. It's not. It's not my area. Except just sort of politically being attuned to. I have done research on test bias, is why I know about the uh, changes in the <coughs> SAT. But analogies, per se, I have not studied. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I also said I would say just a little bit about learning progressions, because we've heard uh, so much about them. NSF is really um, very keen on these ideas. Um, I, I think they're kind of being oversold at present, um, but they they also hold a lot of promise, and they hold a lot of promise in K-12 classrooms or in um, very self-consciously selected units of study within higher ed, um, because uh, the meaning of a learning progression is quite different in early reading or in a unit of study, a, a unit of science study uh, around certain, something about cells. Because, um, in fact, you could think of the science curriculum as being just strand after strand after strand. And then what's not captured in these progressions is sort of the cross integration of all of those things, you know, because um, curricularly we sort of learn about a thing and then we learn about another thing. Um, and then uh, recognizing the sameness and differences is what eventually makes us an expert. And I don't think the learning progressions research, pretty, pretty um, new, uh, actually th thinks about how all of the progressions fit together to be a, a schema of expertise. A tapestry. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not there at all. 
But in any case, I do think as a measurement, as a psychometric expert, learning progressions um, have been important to move away from the way assessments have been, large scale assessments have been developed traditionally in this country, which is this giant soup of all the possible items, a big cross section of all the possible items, um, and then some statistical uh, check on whether they do discrimination among high performing and low performing students, and then presto, they're in the exam. Um, and even with a um, test framework, most tests have a blueprint that is these content strands crossed by these cognitive levels is usually pretty simple, just a, a, a two-dimensional uh, display like that. Um, it's still quite cross-sectional. And the problem with that is representing to test users how you get better at something is not a part of traditional assessment Development. So learning progressions are an answer to that. And interestingly enough, it comes out of the content. The content experts have been teaching this to the measurement experts. So if you like sort of knowing sociology of this, it's cool that the psychometricians are having to pay attention. Because they just, uh, they uh, <laughs> have, have just developed very sophisticated methodologies for ordering things statistically. And then if you actually look closely at any of that, the items are ordered by odd things other than increasing confidence. It could be an odd feature of an item that makes it move up and down that quantitative scale quite di differently. So they do not have rich teaching implications in the way that learning progressions do because they have to satisfy two requirements. Typically, they're built by asking content experts to say, well, what order do you think things come in? And by the way, the more you teach them in the order you think they come in, the more that becomes true and true. <laughs> but you actually, you actually do use fairly sophisticated uh, psychometric techniques to test whether that's true or not. So you don't just stick with the old uh, scope and sequence charts from curricular materials, which were just the opinions of experts. Um, so uh, this is one of the earliest ones. And I actually I pasted four things here that actually come from all the way from scribbles to kind of what a second grade uh, writer's typical story looks like. Um, and these are very helpful because they help you sort of think what next. They also help you know what's normal. Um, and the um, reading and writing specialists um, in the 80s did a lot of work around what they call emergent literacy. They learned things like kids know lots about language and print um, before they memorize letter sounds, for example. <clears throat> and so you could attend more to natural progressions uh, if you began to model these kinds of things. Uh, in mathematics, um, here are some of the experts. Uh, the, the, this work is uh, more recent. Um, these learning trajectories, uh, made from the second bullet here, are different from previous efforts to define learning sequences. They focus on meaningful learning, are guided by a constructivist learning theory, and are based on instructional design experiments. So you actually test out if you think this is a threshold that you have to get before going on, you actually you evaluate that in small um, um, small experiments in classrooms. Uh, so, let's say that you're looking at these learning trajectories and you're watching a student go through this. How are you reporting that to them? I mean, is it still like, here's your B in this one small section of the class, mm -hmm. and you're supposed mm -hmm. to somehow on your own piece all this together, and the next teacher is supposed to piece that together from the B? Or like, how is any of this progress being tracked? in the system instead of just by a researcher somewhere? Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question since it's very new in higher ed. I know some <clears throat> scholars around the country who are trying to do it in science classrooms at university level. I can tell you in Australia how it's done with this. So they have a, a tradition of this now over a decade. <clears throat> they have big charts on the wall uh, for both writing and reading. 
Um, so they have examples of a text you would have to read to be at this level. And then also an example of the kind of paper you'd have to write explaining to the teacher what you understood about that text. And similarly, they have uh, writing uh, continua, that big, big, uh, lovely colored posters, I should have brought some of them, uh, to put up to say, here's what we think um, an expert um, passage, or a writing sample at this level would look like versus this level. So you can see that you're doing a good job, but you have, you're not finished. You have uh, this level and this level, etc. And then they have little arrows pointing to the features of those tests that were um, effective in saying, go ahead, Doug, say. Oh, sorry, the top level is Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, there was an NPR story this week about someone who hadn't finished reading Moby Dick yet. Yeah, so it, it must be iconic, you know, that, that would be the, the furthest up there. Uh, do you know if they also have similar charts for other courses, or, or, or do they just use those charts for reading, and are those charts handed to the next teacher? Do they take a copy of it home in um, any way? They share, this, um, because they have curricula in other countries so. <laughs> <laughs> that we don't have, uh, <laughs> they share them across the school, across the state. Uh, there's a nice uh, com um, compatibility between the way that the large-scale assessment uh, that was one of the, the points there. The orange book cover that I showed you is from the uh, National Research Council book, Knowing What Students Know, um, and it makes a big point about learning progressions. Uh, and some of the NSF attention, I think, comes from that NRC panel report. And they make the case that a learning progression is a good way to relate what I do in the classroom, maybe even only in one locus on the scale, um, that relates to large-scale assessments that are being done, uh, in that case, across the province uh, in, uh, in Australia. 